we proclaim the message that Jesus and Jesus alone saves. Jacksonville needs you and me sharing our faith in a powerful Christ who alone saves. Worthy of the glory, 
He's the son of righteousness, worthy of the glory. Good morning. Welcome to this worship service this morning. Again, happy Father's Day to those fathers in the room. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you acknowledging that anything good in any of us earthly fathers is merely a reflection of the perfections in you. Thank you for being our perfect heavenly Father, and calling us your sons and daughters. Thank you that we can come together in worship and enjoy the love, the perfect love, the unceasing love of a kind Father who does all things for the good of his children. Lord, we pray that those who are earthly fathers will be inspired today. We pray that those who are carrying out the role of earthly parentage will be equipped and encouraged. But we pray above all else that your son, who surely is the pride of heaven, will be high and lifted up. Thank you for the great honor it is to gather in worship. May we join together with unity, one heart, one voice in praise to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we as earthly fathers know the pride that there is in seeing our sons and daughters do well. It is a feeling that is hard to prepare for when you first recognize how much that child means to you, and to see them succeed just does something in your heart that you were not prepared to experience. How much more the father who delights to see his son exalted in his accurate perfections. Let's worship the Son this morning in honor of the Father, the Heavenly Father. Let's stand as we sing.
What is uncommon to us that the Father has done is it also pleased him to crush his son for our healing. We have no ability to understand what that love is, but we are beneficiaries of that love. We will celebrate his name again, but remember that he was given on our behalf the son for us that we might know the privileges of being a child of God. Let's sing, Oh, Praise the Name. we know we'll praise him forever. It's because there is an empty tomb over there in the Holy Land. 
There is a place where a body once lain and is now empty. And there is a Savior in heaven who reigns over all things. And we will be able to enjoy his presence forever. Until that day that forever begins, we know we can live this life for his glory and for his good because he lives. ago, Pastor Heath showed a video about how we were going to go over the budget, and one of those things was he needed some extra money for repairs, um, roof damage, paint, uh, air conditioning, and he said that everybody, if everybody in the church donated a certain amount of money, like we could take care of that very easily, and before the video was even over, she was nudging me, saying, Mommy, Mommy, we need to, we need to do that, we need to give that money. I said, okay, Madison, this is the first time I'm hearing of it. She goes, but I want to earn money, Mommy. I want to earn my own money. 
I said, okay, well, what do you like to do? Well, I like cats. So we have some friends who have cats and we were just kind of joking around, Jason and I. Oh, she could clean cat litter boxes. And she heard the idea and was so <laughs> enthusiastic about it. So, okay, went over, cleaned three cat litter boxes, not one complaint. I'm gonna give all my money to the church and now they can afford buckets of paint. It, it's pretty amazing. Actually, I, I, I posted on Twitter, it just put me under conviction. You know, my little six-year-old knows nothing of money or budgets or planning or any of that kind of stuff. You know, if you hand her two quarters, she thinks that's far more valuable than a $10 bill. But she knew that our church had a need and God had graciously given her a way to at least help with that need, even if a very small way. And here I am, <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll give God 10%, uh, but I'm gonna hold on to 90%. She's the better steward than I am. She just feels like the church is her family and she would give anything to her family. They always tell you that your children are going to be the most humbling experience of your life. And with her, it is no different. And to see her heart and for her to want to give everything that she has and to go and clean a cat litter box to get that is just, it's amazing. And it's a great example for her little brother. He's only two, but he looks up to her and wants to do everything she does. So hopefully this will be a chance for him to kind of see what, what giving it all to God looks like. If we can instill into our kids, even when they're super young, um, to, to give what they have, that God has called us to give from what He has given us, then, then it's gonna be so much easier for them later on um, to give of themselves, uh, to, to give obviously a, a bigger income than a quarter, uh, but not just that, but to devote themselves to God's work here at First Baptist or, or wherever God calls them. That's an incredible story. I hope we all have faith like children. If you'd stand with me, we're going to read scripture together this morning. Our scripture reading today comes from Luke chapter 13, verse 5. It says, I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. May God bless the reading of his word. It's my privilege this morning to share with you the report from one in, a one, one in 1,000 this week. Remember, the goal here is that you all would be talking about and sharing uh, in Sunday school about one in a 1,000, your attempts to share the gospel and to be intentional in that way, that you would be uh, encouraging one another, that you would be praying for the lost together, and then reporting so that each week we can come in here and celebrate together what God is doing among us. It's my privilege to report to you that this week, 229 people in our church shared the gospel with 358 people and 24 of those trusted in Jesus Christ as their Savior. Since we've started keeping track, we've shared the gospel with 11,821 people and seen 670 people trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior. And I want to encourage you to continue striving to be faithful and to share with those around you the life-giving message of Jesus Christ. As you just saw in the video, we are in the middle of a special giving uh, season where we are taking this month uh, to give to what we're calling Project 375 to try to meet some of these capital needs that we have as a church, some failing elevators, failing media equipment, and failing air conditioners, things like that that are sort of all hitting at one time. And so we're trying to meet that need faithfully. Uh, so we want to encourage you to consider giving $375 above what you normally give. Again, we know not every family can do that, but we know that some families can do more. And so we ask you to pray and consider how you might be involved in helping the church meet this need. I want to remind you that you can do that by giving online in that special uh, slot there where you can designate that giving for that or you can designate it on your envelope or on your check. So let's pray now and ask the Lord to help us to be faithful. Heavenly Father, you have indeed entrusted much to us. You've entrusted to us the gospel of your Son, Jesus Christ. You've saved us and reconciled us to yourself so that we might share this glorious gospel with others and have the joy of partnering with you in this great kingdom work. God, help us to be faithful. 
Help us to be bold, yet help us to be intentional. Help us to prioritize sharing the gospel above everything else in our lives, knowing that it is the thing that will last forever. God, I pray that you would help us to be good stewards of all that you've given us. God, you've given us everything that we have. God, you've provided for all of our needs. God, I pray that as we uh, seek you in this time, as we try to be faithful, that you would help us. God, give us all that we need and more. God, we entrust this church to you. God, we ask that you would meet the needs that are here. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
happy Father's Day. It is uh, great to be with you today on a special day like this and to be able to worship the risen Christ and to look at His Word together. Let me ask you to turn in your Bibles to Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3, we have been taking some time this summer and we'll take some more time to look at who we are and what we're going to be as a body of believers as we move together into the future. And one of the things that we're doing uh, as we focus on that together is looking at the book of Jonah. And when people think about the book of Jonah, a lot of times what they think about is this great big fish that we talked about last week. But really what we're going to see this week is that the high point of Jonah and the high point of the whole narrative really happens in Jonah chapter 3. The fish was important to get Jonah someplace. And he gets to that place in Jonah chapter 3. And that's what we're looking at this morning. And this is what God says. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation which I am going to tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three days walk. Then Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk, and he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. And then the people of Nineveh believed in God. And they called a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe from him, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat on the ashes. He issued a proclamation, and it said, In Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let man, beast, herd, or flock taste a thing. Do not let them eat or drink water. But both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth, and let men call on God earnestly, that each may turn from his wicked way and from the violence which is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. When God saw their deeds, that they turned from their wicked way, then God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Let's pray. Father in heaven, this is your word. You have preserved it to us today. And Father, I want to ask that you would overcome a weak and a fallen messenger, and weak and fallen hearers, and change us into the image of Christ by the power of your mighty spirit. Father, would you awaken our hearts today to the power of your word? Would you awaken us to your grace? And thus awakened, would you send us into this city, into this state, into this world? And Father, would you awaken a city for you? Just as you did so many thousands of years ago in Nineveh, would you awaken a city again? Awaken us to Christ. Awaken us to his word. Start it now. We're bold to ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. As we've been looking together at the book of Jonah, we've been talking about a malady in the soul of Jonah. We've been talking about a sickness in his heart, a disease of spirit that I've called the Jonah syndrome. And the Jonah syndrome is a syndrome that afflicted the prophet and it afflicts us. It's a disease in our heart where we are happy to have received the grace of God, which leads to light and life. And we we don't care whether other people receive that grace, which leads to light and life. We are happy to sit and be a recipient of grace from the hands of another messenger, from the mouth of someone else, but we don't view it as our responsibility to open up our mouths and share that same grace of God with other people. It is 
a disease of the spirit that Jonah had, and it didn't get him very far. Uh, His idea was that he was going to receive God's call to go to Nineveh, and then he was going to turn on his heel and run in the opposite direction as far away as he could to Tarshish, and God had other plans. God treated Jonah's syndrome with a storm, with a near-death experience as he almost drowned in the Mediterranean Sea, and then with a fishy grave. And what we see by the time we get to Jonah chapter 3 this week is that God did more than just stop Jonah's flight away from faithfulness. He also pointed him in the direction of following God more faithfully than he had. We see in Jonah chapter 3, Jonah's mission. It's a recommissioning. He gets sent on the mission again. And we read these remarkable words in Jonah chapter 3 verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. This is the only time that we see in the Bible, in the life of a prophet, this kind of disobedience that we saw from Jonah, where he moves in the opposite direction of faithfulness. God chastises him in all the ways that he did. And now God gives Jonah a second chance. He gives him a second chance to be a missionary, a second chance to be a messenger, a second chance to communicate grace to this great city of Nineveh. The second time that the word comes to Jonah, the calling is a little bit more open-ended than it was in Jonah chapter 1. Chapter 3, verse 2, God says, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation which I'm going to tell you. In chapter 1, verse 2, he said, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. It's a little more vague the second time. It's as though God is saying, hey, I'm giving you a second chance here, but you're going to go and you're going to say whatever I tell you. There's no warning about what that might be. There's no foreshadowing about what it might be. It's just you go and you be obedient and you say whatever I tell you to say when you get there. Jonah responds differently to this second call than he did the first time he received it. When he received the first mission, God said in Jonah chapter 1, Arise and go to Nineveh, the great city. And verse 3 says, But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. That's not what he does this time. In Jonah chapter 3, verse 3, it says, So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Jonah has been beaten into submission by the sovereign God. A storm, a near drowning, and three horrible days in the belly of a fish has taught Jonah that running away from God and faithlessness to a city is not what it's cracked up to be. And so Jonah heads off in the direction of Nineveh. This time he's going to obey. God told Jonah, I'm going to give you a message when you get to Nineveh. And I want you to preach whatever in the world I tell you to preach when you get there. And we find out from what Jonah says and from the response of the people what the constituent parts of his message was. What made up the message of Jonah? Well, I want to talk about three elements of the message of Jonah that we can find out about in Jonah chapter 3. First of all, Jonah received from God and preached a message of judgment. In Jonah chapter 3, verse 4, the Bible says, Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk and cried out and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh will be overthrown. This great city, Nineveh, is going to be thrown over. 
in just 40 days. 40 days, you know, from the Bible is a spiritually significant amount of time. It's the amount of time it rained in the flood. It's the amount of time that Moses and the people fasted. It's a spiritually significant amount of time. And Jonah is saying, you have 40 days. The clock is ticking, and then God is going to overthrow this whole city. Now, when something gets thrown over, that's not a good thing. When you take something that is stationary and you upend it, bad things will happen. Connor was three years old, and we had carpet that was not beautiful at all. It was old and stained and ripped in places, and to our eyes, that meant it had been childproofed. Uh, there was no danger of anything worse happening to this carpet. What else can you do to it? Uh, and in, anyway, as soon as we spend all that money, carpet is expensive. And as soon as you spend that money and you get new carpet, now everybody's going to be a nervous wreck about what these kids are going to do to the carpet. So we'll just leave it childproofed until we have a running shot at not having these kids mess it up. Well, one afternoon I was out of town on a trip for ministry, and Lauren left three-year-old Connor unattended for like three seconds. That's all it takes. And he decided the best way he could spend that time was to go into the pantry and get out a bottle of sesame oil and turn it over in our uh, living room. And so Lauren comes from wherever she'd been, and there's this like greasy, wet, disgusting spot uh, in the living room, and she tried to scrub it out, and uh, it looked clean at first, but then after a few minutes, the oil came back up, and she scrubbed again, and the oil came back up, and she had a cleaner come in, and they cleaned it, but the oil came back up. She calls me, and she said, I think we're going to have to get new carpet. And I said, surely not. There's no possible way. Surely we can clean this out. Well, I got back from out of town, and when I walked in our living room, when I walked in our house, it smelled like the kitchen of some restaurant that failed a health code inspection. I mean, it just... <laughs> It reeked. And from the moment you walked in the house and then you walk in and you just see this oily spot in the carpet. And so sure enough, we spent all that money uh, to have the carpet replaced because our carpet was destroyed after a bottle of sesame oil had been upended. That is what God says he's going to do to a whole city. He's going to overthrow it. He's going to upend the whole thing. Uh, we see similar language to this in Genesis chapter 19, verses 24 to 25. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven, and he overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. When Jonah says this city is going to be overthrown, we're supposed to read that and remember what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah, and a whole city was overthrown, destroyed by fire from heaven. Even what grew on the ground ceased to exist. When God says he's going to overthrow a city, he means he's going to overthrow a city. Jonah is preaching a message of severe judgment. It's not an encouraging message. It's not one that uh, makes your spine just tingle with joy. But Jonah didn't just preach a message of judgment. We know from Jonah chapter 3 that he also preached a message of faith and repentance. He preached a message of faith and repentance. And Jonah chapter 3, verse 5, the people have a shocking reaction. It's a surprise. Forty days and God is going to destroy your city. Now, we can imagine a number of responses to that. You can imagine, oh, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. What does this guy know about God? We could imagine, that's hysterical. <laughs> I'm not going to overthrow a city. 600,000 people live here. This is Nineveh. This is the Assyrian Empire. Nobody's going to overthrow this city in 40 days. Are you kidding me? <laughs> That's ridiculous. It's a joke. We could imagine the harsh Ninevites saying, somebody kill that guy. Just kill him right now. And they would do to what they did to many of their en enemies, which is just put his head on a pole. 
All of those responses are responses that we can imagine. The most shocking response to me is the one they had. We read about it in Jonah chapter 3 verse 5. Then the people of Nineveh believed in God. They heard a harsh judgmental proclamation and instead of hardening their hearts, instead of laughing, instead of rubbing out the threat or trying to, they believed it. They believed in God. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. There's no way in the world to please God without faith. We know that. We've heard that if you've been around a church for very long. But why is that the case? Why is it that there's no possible way to please God except by faith? There's a couple of answers to that question. The one that's most relevant for us today is that God has chosen to reveal himself with words. He has not chosen to reveal himself with pictures. He's not chosen to reveal himself to most people by walking into the room and saying, here I am, look at me, have a good look. This is me. He chooses to reveal himself to most people by his word. He revealed himself to the Ninevites by a word spoken from a prophet. He reveals himself to us by a word written in the scripture. God reveals himself by words which makes God fundamentally a messenger. He is a God who sends messages. And the only real way to honor a messenger is to believe what they say. If a messenger comes to you with a message and they say whatever they say and you say, I don't believe that. You can say anything else you want to say about the messenger, but it will still disregard the message. You can say, I like your clothes, but I don't like your message. The messenger won't care. You can say, I think you're funny, but I don't like your message. The messenger won't care. You can say, I like your cute little stories. The messenger won't care. The way to honor a messenger is to rest in, believe in, trust in the word he says. That's why it's impossible to, believe, to, to honor God and to bring God joy and to please him without faith. Because God is fundamentally a messenger who gives us words. And we can say whatever else we want to say about God, but if we reject what he says, we cannot honor him. Well, we see this in the Ninevites. The Ninevites hear a message that would not be, if you would go to a marketing firm. Let's say First Baptist Church is going to go to a marketing firm and say, hey, tell us what message we ought to give to people. They're not going to tell us to say to people, in 40 days you're all going to be dead. This is not a message that is calculated to win over people. But that's exactly what it does because when God works, he works through the message he sends and not through the message we create. And so the people hear this harsh message, you're about to die. And they believe it. And they don't just believe that it's true, they respond in a different way. We learn from the text of Jonah chapter 3 that Jonah preached a message not just of faith, but of faith and repentance. We see brokenheartedness. We see contrition on the part of the Ninevites. In verse 5, it says, the people of Nineveh believed in God, and they called a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe from him, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat on the ashes. He issued a proclamation, and it said, In Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let man, beast, herd, or flock taste a thing. Do not let them eat or drink water, but both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth. There is this outward display of brokenness in three ways. There is fasting, there is the wearing of sackcloth, and there is the reality that they are seated in ashes. This is a common reality in the Bible that when people turn to God in seriousness and in devotion, 
it is communicated in ways like this, which were culturally significant at the time. In Nehemiah chapter 9, upon hearing of the sin of the people at the rebuilding of the temple, we read in Nehemiah 9, 1 to 2, now on the 24th day of this month, the sons of Israel assembled with fasting in sackcloth and with dirt upon them. The descendants of Israel separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. Daniel, upon hearing what God had planned to do and had said he would do in the prophets, Daniel in Daniel chapter 9 verse 3 says, I gave my attention to the Lord God to seek him by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. The point of the sackcloth and the ashes and the fasting is to communicate such brokenness over sin that I will receive no earthly comfort. I'm not going to eat anything. I'm not going to wear anything that's comfortable. I'm not going to sit in a comfortable chair. I'm going to place a burden of hunger in my belly. I'm going to wear itchy clothes on my back, and I'm going to sit in ashes, communicating that what's, what once had been mighty is now burned to the ground. It's, it's demonstrating the total destruction of any sort of self-made glory. Another thing these things do is it communicates equality. The king does it. It doesn't matter how rich you are, it doesn't matter how powerful you are, you're going to have the same thing to eat as anybody else. You're going to have the same harsh, scruffy clothing on your back as anybody else, and you're going to sit in the same ash heap that everybody else does. And it's not just erasing the distinction between kings and nobles and commoners, it even, in Jonah chapter 3, erases the distinction between people and animals. Even the animals are wearing sackcloth. Even the animals are fasting. This is an extreme pronouncement that we want to communicate broadly brokenness over sin. But it's not just an outward show of religiosity. Verse 8 says, both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth and let men call on God earnestly that each may turn from his wicked way and from the violence which is in his hands. This isn't just an outward display of repentance. This is real repentance. The king says, look at your wicked hands and turn away from what you've done with them. Be truly broken over the violence that you've committed. Jonah preached a message of judgment, but he also preached a message of faith and repentance. Third, Jonah preached a message of grace and forgiveness. They did all these things, and in verse 9 it says, who knows? God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. The people had reason to believe that if they would repent and turn from the wickedness that they had done, that God would have mercy and forgive. That's in fact exactly what he did. Verse 10, when God saw their deeds, that they turned away from their wicked way. Notice it doesn't say when God saw the sackcloth and the ashes and the fasting. He doesn't examine their outward display of religion. He examines their actual response. When he saw their deeds, that they turned away from their wickedness, then God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. There's judgment in Jonah's proclamation, but there's grace and mercy in what he preached as well. There is mercy in God's pronouncements of judgment. This is so important for us to understand. It's so important for us to let this sink in. Because when we understand that there's mercy in God's pronouncements of judgments, it will change the way we speak and think 
about those pronouncements of judgment. Whenever God sends an outpouring of grace and mercy, whenever in the Bible or in church history, when He has poured out His Spirit for an abundance of grace and mercy, He always begins that work with an overwhelming awareness of guilt for sin. You can't have the grace and the mercy of God without knowing what the grace and the mercy covers. God always and only awakens people to His grace after first awakening them to their sin. You cannot see grace without seeing sin. And that's why there's mercy in God's pronouncements of judgment, is because if you are here today and you have a profound awareness of your sin, if you would look at your hands and see they are wicked, not just the hands of the Ninevites, if you would be aware that your tongue is wicked and that your thoughts are wicked and that your actions are wicked, if you can see that God is showing you that sin and His mercy is very close. His grace is not far. Because the first indication that you would have that you are about to experience the grace of God is you would be aware of the sin in your own life and heart. There is a divine principle of mercy and judgment, and it's this, that when God announces judgment and His people repent, God will respond with mercy, and He always relents. That's the way it works. If God shows you your sin, if God is showing you your sin, that you're far away from Him, that you don't do what He wants you to do, and that you do what He doesn't want you to do, and you say and think things that He hates, if God is showing you that that's true today, then that's the first indication you would have of receiving His mercy. It's true in Jonah. God saw their deeds, that they turned from their wicked way, and He relented from the calamity, and He didn't do it. It's true in the other prophets as well. It's true in Jeremiah. The prophet Jeremiah in chapter 18, verses 7 to 8 says, the prophet speaking for God, at one moment I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to uproot, to pull down, or to destroy it. If that nation against which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent concerning the calamity I planned to bring on it. We see it in Jonah. We see it in Jeremiah. We see it in Jesus. This is what we read during the Bible reading. If you don't repent, you will perish. You hear the grace there? If. If. If you don't repent, you will perish. But Jesus is saying, if you will repent, you won't. God will relent of the calamity that your sin brings on you, and He will not overthrow your life. We see it in the Apostle John. If you confess your sins, He's faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Brothers and sisters, if God is showing you your sin today, He's leading you to His mercy and to His grace. And you need to do what the Ninevites did and repent and believe Him. Jonah's message in Nineveh is the same message as ours today with just a few key distinctions. First of all, instead of being in Nineveh, we're in Jacksonville. So we're called to a different city than Jonah was. The second is this side of the cross, we know that God's pronouncements of judgment of faith and repentance and of mercy and grace all hang on one name. 
the name given among men by which you cannot be saved without it, and it's the name Jesus Christ. It's the only name given among men by which we must be saved, and without the name of Jesus, we stand under judgment. Without belief in His name, we will be overthrown. Without trusting in His life and death and resurrection for sin, we will not know God's mercy and grace. But with Jesus Christ comes the ability to give a guarantee that when you are aware of your sin and you confess that sin in the name of Jesus and believe that he pays for it on the cross, you and everybody you know will be forgiven. It's a guarantee. Jonah's message is our message. Jonah's methods are our methods. There's a tension in Jonah chapter 3, verse 3, and verse 4. Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three days walk. So, if you want to go all through the city of Nineveh, it's going to take you three days. It's a big city. But then verse 4, Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk. And he cried out and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Jonah didn't even get halfway through where he needed to be, and he disappears from the narrative. You don't hear about Jonah again for the rest of chapter 3. And yet you have a revival in the city. How did that happen? Well, I think we are encouraged to think about two things. Number one is the word of mouth. Jonah didn't tell everybody, but he told people who told people who told people. He told this group of people over here, and they went home and told their family. And they were out in the backyard that night cooking out or whatever they did in Nineveh back then. And they're talking over the fence with their neighbor and telling them about it. And they believed. And then that guy went to the Rotary Club or the Kiwanis Club or whatever they had then. And he told them about it and they believed. So the spread of this good news was not contingent on one guy. But this one guy was the spark. And then as that spread through the whole city, it spread like wildfire. We're even encouraged to believe in verse 6 that Jonah didn't tell the king, but the word reached the king. The king heard about it from somebody else, and then he repented. So Jonah, after just one day, reached a whole city because everybody heard this news and did not want to keep it for themselves. It didn't even occur to them to keep it to themselves. And so you have a whole city changed by the word of mouth, but not just by the word of mouth, also by the work of God. There's no doubt about it, this is a miracle. There's no doubt about it that it takes God and His work to save hundreds of thousands of people. There is no doubt about it that it doesn't matter how good a preacher you are, how good a messenger you are, how relational you are, there is no amount of sharing this message that will change someone's heart. God has to show up and God has to do it. And what I want to say to you this morning is that what Jonah saw happen in Nineveh is what we need to work towards in Jacksonville. That is our job in this city to fight against the Jonah syndrome and receive the grace of God such that it would never occur to us to be quiet about it but that we would go out into this city with a message of judgment. Yes, you are dead in trespasses and sins, but also with a message of mercy and grace that if you will repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. Everybody in Jacksonville, a million and a half people, can be saved by the name of Jesus Christ. It will take our speaking, and it will take a work of God. It is way above our pay grade to decide what God is going to do in this city. But it is our responsibility, because God has made it our responsibility, to reach Jacksonville for Jesus Christ, to share the good news of Jesus Christ with everybody who will listen. I've been telling you for 
uh, a couple of weeks now that in January we're going to launch a uh, new and a systematic and a church-wide program to take the gospel to this city. I want to let you know today what we're going to call that. We're calling it Reach Jacksonville. And it is going to be uh, our way to organize our church uh, through Sunday school, through Sunday school teachers, and through other leaders in our church to get the gospel to the city. And let me tell you what the goal is. The goal is to see Jacksonville have a massive and a great revival and to turn from sin to Jesus Christ. That's what the goal is. We are not responsible for what happens once we preach the message, but we are responsible for preaching the message. And so with Reach Jacksonville, we are going to make it our job at the First Baptist Church to be sure that every man, woman, boy, and girl in this city hears the gospel of Jesus Christ and is given an opportunity to repent of their sins and trust in Him for eternal life. That's our job. And we're going to start small. We're going to start with every member in our church sharing the gospel with everybody they know. That's what Reach Jacksonville is. What it means to be a member of First Baptist Church is that you agree that one of the most important things we could do would be to be on mission for God in this city, and we're going to make it our responsibility to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with everybody we know. And Reach Jacksonville is going to be our effort to equip you, to train you, and to organize you to do that with the people you work with, with the people on your streets, with the people at your family reunions, and with the people that serve you your food when you go out to eat. That's what Reach Jacksonville is. We must take the gospel of Jesus Christ to this city. And we must do it believing that God loves to use messengers to preach hard truths about sin and glorious truths about grace to save people. He has done it before. He did it 2,800 years ago in a city called Nineveh. We just read about it. A whole city from the king on down got saved. God can save a city. He's done it before. He did it in this country a bunch of different times. One was in the 1740s called the Great Awakening. During the Great Awakening, numerous preachers led thousands and thousands of people to faith in Jesus Christ. One of those preachers was Samuel Davies. And in 1757, he wrote about the amazing things he had seen in this great revival of the 1740s. And this is what he said, about 16 years ago in the northern colonies when all religious concern was much out of fashion and the generality lay in a dead sleep in sin, having at best the form of godliness but nothing of the power. When the country was in peace and prosperity, free from the calamities of war and the epidemical sickness, when, in short, there was no extraordinary calls to repentance. He said everything was great. People had money. They weren't sick. We weren't at war. Everything was fine. There was nothing going on that would scare anybody to death. But then, suddenly, a deep general concern about eternal things spread through the country. Sinners started out of their slumbers, broke off from their vices, began to cry out, what shall we do to be saved? And made it the great business of their life to prepare for the world to come. Then the gospel seemed almighty and carried all before it. It pierced the very hearts of men with an irresistible power. I have seen thousands at once melted down under it, all eager to hear as for life and hardly a dry eye to be seen among them. It happened before in New England. It happened in Jacksonville with this church seeing tens of thousands of people come to Christ. Let me ask you a question. What if the miracle of downtown Jacksonville didn't end in the 1990s? 
What if the miracle of downtown Jacksonville is something we're experiencing right now? We just can't tell yet because we're in the thick of it. What if the person who's going to tell the person, who's going to tell four other people, who's going to tell a hundred other people, what if that person is sitting in this room right now? God's done it before. What in the world is to keep him from doing it again? We cannot force the hand of God, but we can pray. And so the reason I'm announcing Reach Jacksonville right now is because that's exactly what I want you to do. I want you to spend the next few months praying that God would save this city. That God would take the message of judgment and grace and mercy and faith and pierce the hearts of a million and a half people in this city. Don't you want to see that? I'm asking you to pray that that would happen, and I'm asking you to be making a commitment that you'll do whatever it takes. That you would say, I don't care what my job is, I don't care what my 401k is, I don't care what they ask me to do at that church. If they ask me to go tell lost people about Jesus Christ, I will do it. And if revival does not come in our lifetimes, it won't be because we didn't pray and it won't be because we didn't try. But that God would be in heaven right now today looking down on us and he would find us faithful and his verdict on our faithfulness would be in 2018 in Jacksonville, there were no Jonas. God, let there be no Jonas in this church. But let there be men, women, boys and girls eager to take the gospel to the world, to our country, to our state, and to every person in this city, by God's grace, will reach Jacksonville for Christ. Would you stand and pray with me? Father in heaven, you are a God of grace and mercy, and we can anticipate from your word the outpouring of your grace and mercy when the truth is being told about sin and righteousness. And so, Father, we are asking you to do what only you can do. First, lead us to be a people who don't just receive your grace and mercy, but who share it with a lost and a dying world. And we are asking that you would go before us, and even now, You'd be preparing the hearts of hundreds of thousands, a million and a half men and women to see their sin, to turn from their sin, and believe that in Jesus Christ there is no penalty for their sin. I'm praying for a city who would speak the name of Jesus. I'm praying for a church that would fight this sickness of heart that Jonah had with everything in us. And we would desire, as those who have received grace, to share it with everyone we know. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. The prophet Isaiah says that the word never goes out and returns void. And so every week we have a time of response because the word works. For some of you, Maybe you've never realized before that your hands and your mouth and your feet and your minds are wicked, and you will be overthrown if you don't turn from your sin and trust in Jesus Christ. If you want to do that this morning, we have people down front who want to talk with you and pray with you and help you know how you can have confidence that your sins are forgiven in Christ. Maybe you're here this morning and you're a Jonah. Not as famous as he was, but you've got the same sickness of heart. And you would say, I'm not going to fight. I'm not going to run to Tarshish. But by God's grace, I will give my life for the preaching of the gospel in this city. If that's you and you'd like to respond, these people would love to talk with you and pray with you as well. And you come as we continue in worship.